All right. <laughs> Thanks for coming. This is Dr. Ikeno Obasi. He has come here from Nigeria on a uh, AFOX Catalyst grant. And when you think about what this is catalyzing, consider the fact that this is his first time outside of Nigeria. And uh, it's not just his first time at Oxford. Um, and, uh, and we've already been having some really great conversations about science. And um, what can I say? He is now a senior lecturer, uh, just moved to a new position. And I forget, formerly at University of Lokoja in Nigeria. And now the university is? Very invested in Dufa Litich. What he said. So um, it's a pleasure to have him here in Oxford. Uh, and uh, I think going forward, we're going to be meeting to discuss hydrological modeling. And anyone who's interested in uh, hydrological modeling using numerical methods to model groundwater flow um, is welcome to join us. So come talk to us after um, if you feel like you want to get involved. Uh, with that, hi Seth, that's Seth. Um, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure between all of us. Uh, Richard has been a very wonderful host. Uh, let me thank you after this presentation. We are actually going to look at groundwater occurrence in fractured sedimentary rocks within the Abakali area of Nigeria. Actually, the area is densely populated, as you can see from the map, and um, the, uh, the work area is uh, about 30 minutes coordinate square, which is longer than that. Um, Sometimes the temperature can be as high as 40 degrees Celsius. Celsius. Uh, the population is over 600,000 in that environment. So water is a, a challenge because the water occurs purely in fractures and harnessing uh, them are quite expensive. So that's uh, the population keeps increasing at about 5% annually. This is the presentation outline. I will briefly introduce myself and then tell us one or two things about previous researches we have done within that environment. Uh, just as uh, Richard said, I'm, uh, I have a background in geology and then uh, my master's PhD is in applied geophysics. Uh, I'm married with three children, two boys and a girl. The girl is the last one, so she can make trouble. But she has two advantages of being a woman and also being the last baby of the house. And so I, my research interest is majorly applying near surface geophysics uh, in sustainable exploration of natural resources. So in recent times, I took it further, narrowed it further to groundwater exploration. And that's what we have been doing in recent times. Just as Richard said, uh, our first grant brought me to uh, Oxford, and that will be in Oxford the 23rd of October as next month. The, the motivation is the one, the interdisciplinary nature of groundwater challenges, and the fact that we need to collaborate as two scientists to solve such environmental problems. And uh, again, we need to ensure sustainable exploitation of natural resources. So the aims are. One, I came to see collaboration in developing models that will encourage us and assist in predicting groundwater occurrence and distribution in Abakali area of Nigeria, and also promote exploitation of the resources. Uh, I also want to see if we can develop a link by getting hydro integrating hydrological models with uh, uh, machine learning in climate forecasts we want to see if we can predict impact of climate change on groundwater resources, especially the aquifer systems within that sector of Nigeria and fractured rock aquifer, uh, generally in Africa. The fractured rock aquifers are common, are more common in basement complexes as ignores metamorphic terrains. But uh, surprisingly, most times, and oftentimes we see it also in sub-Saharan African region occurring in sedimentary basins. So is a, most, of, most part of the African region depend actually on fractured rock aquifers for portable water supply. 
And on that note, it became quite important that a study on factual or capital will aid the achievement of some goals of the SDG within the African region. As you can see, like GoTray, the idea of healthy life for all, uh, go seas, uh, water supply, and then um, for the water supply and management, go 14, sustainable marine uh, economy, and go 17, collaboration, partnership for sustainable development. So we are going to look now on how we have tried to use the uh, integrated geophysical method in characterizing the aquifer system within these fracture rocks in this region. Uh, you cannot uh, separate the Abakalik region from the parent basin, which is the Benue Trop. So the Abakalik sub basin is actually part of the southern Benue Trop of Nigeria. And the Benue Trop of Nigeria has its origin from the separation of the African plate from the South American plate uh, around the Gulf of Guinea. So you have what we call the, the triple wide junction. So this way you have this one developed and this arm developed to form the Atlantic Ocean. This is the third arm which ran through Nigeria into Chad. And so the Abakaniki region is somewhere here. And the one that is the southern Benue Trop, this is the, the Benue Trop, and this is the southern end. This Benue Trop uh, originated from this, and this is the geology of the area. It's actually an uh, environment that has undergone a series of metamorphism, tectonism, magmatism. And so, because of that, it has a series of anticlines and synclines. And we, that's what brought the term Abakalik Anticlinorium. So this is our work will be concentrating on this. This is the oldest formation there, the Asu River group running at the core of the anticline and being uh, flanked by the younger sediment. What you have here, the Afipo syncline, which is a sub basin, a younger basin, and you have the Anambra basin at the Southwest, we all uh, a younger basin that developed from further uh, depression or tectonic event in this area. Then down this way, you have the Niger Delta Basin, where that is popularly known with our hydrocarbon occurrence in Nigeria. So just as I said earlier, uh, it, the environment has undergone three major tectonic phases, as you can see, and this resulted in movement within the entire Benue Trough, but the movement is more pronounced within this, uh, our research area, the southern portion of the Benue Trough. Ben Kelly in 1989 studied it extensively and uh, wrote a lot of things about the area. The movement is actually a compressional phase, it uh, uh, deformation. It gave rise to foldings, magmatism, and general faulting. So the, the occurrence of groundwater follows the fracture system. And there are also mineralization. So there are a lot of mining activities in the area going on, sulfide deposits within the Abakadiki region. And you can see those tectonic phases led to the formation of the younger basins I mentioned earlier. And uh, Obi Oranko, uh, 2, 4, 2, 11, they have also emphasized low grade metamorphism within the area. Uh, this is a, a sample of a, a fracture trend in the area, which we generated from digital elevation model using uh, aeromagnetic data. And you can see some points of uh, VS and borehole during the area. So the primary problem we realized there is that groundwater exploration slash exploitation is quite difficult because of the geology. And uh, previously, uh, researchers carried out there have not focused on trying to characterize the area for convenience and to you know, solve the problem. So we identified it as a problem. And because of that, we decided to characterize the fracture system bearing aquifer, the aquiferous systems within the fractures using uh, integrating uh, electrical receivity and the electromagnetic method. And we did some drilling of boreholes, logged them, correlated them, and we were able to characterize the area effectively. So for the electromagnetic surveys, we use the uh, Johnny Street Fortree, where we have the the receiver and the, this, the transmitter and the receiver. And this is a, a more convenient uh, machine we used recently, the Zeo Detect Pool Finder, 
Poop Panda is handheld, so you can easily locate uh, water bearing fractures. But the unfortunate thing is that it doesn't give you data that you can play with. So that's why this uh, the geometry for tree is more practical for research purposes. So this is an example of one of the sites. This is horizontal dipole they are carrying out. Uh, this the young man here is the technologist Richard, not our own Richard, now no, the Nigerian Richard. And then this is the MSc student, Mabel, who I did the work with. These are undergraduates that assisted us in the field. And this is also where we are carrying out the vertical electrical sounding when we have delineated a point within that profile. When we acquire the electromagnetic data, we use some of these equations to, to do the processing. Uh, we calculate the depth using this set of equation, and we, we determine the, the real resist uh, conductivity of the layers from this graph. So when we calculate depth, we derive the graph using this figure seven, uh, we derive the depth C using this figure seven, and we use this one to determine the receivity and the conductivities of the layers, assuming a two layer model. So these are the equation creator that we applied in processing the receivity data. So could I, could you go back to that equation and just, just look at it just for a second? What, um, what is this used for? This is for calculating the apparent receivity. Okay. And delta B is the change in voltage I. You say anything more about about this? I just how do you? Okay, okay what we do we measure delta V and or we we measure uh, delta V. We 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 determine it from the machine, whereas this is a constant. The whole of this is a constant. So we generate. We have done these calculations and formed a table before we went to field. So how we are going to do in the field now is to determine current in field and change in potential. My question. Okay. So when we generated the receivity profiles, we processed it using the interface 1D uh, model. And we observed some things about the water bearing fractures. We noticed, as you can see from here, that uh, there's only one the layer model and the synthetic model, they mean two different things. Yes, sometimes they agree, at some point they disagree. And that's what guides interpretation. So once they begin to agree, the layer model must be less than 52 ohm meter. Must be less than 52 ohm meter for it to show groundwater bearing fracture. And if, but that's not enough. Even when it's less than 52 ohm meter, the depth range is also important. It must be more than 10 meter depth range you are seeing mm -hmm. before you assume there could be water. Number three, it must be agreeing with the synthetic model, the green line. If the synthetic model is equal to or less than the, the ohm, the receivity value of the layer model, then there's water. And so in this point, see, we have water here and it's less than 52 ohm meter. In this, uh, in B, we are looking at um, another layer. You notice that when this the stream is higher, there won't be water. But as it's descending, agreeing with the layer model, you see water. That's number one. Number two, the lower the receivity within the water bearing zone, the larger the, the wider the fracture and the higher the volume of water you have. So the water started somewhere here on this layer model, and here it descended. It, the, the receivity reduced. Showing you have more, and the volume of water also increased. Sorry, can I ask a question here? Mm -hmm. I understand which of these two, the red, there's red and yellow curves. Which one comes from the measure? Is or is one of them coming from the measurements? And yes. The other one is coming from where does the other one come from? The other one is software. The software, uh, sort of uh, the software process data of the data. Yes. So they both come. Uh, from it's the called matching. This is just called matching. We did with the software. Okay, so the red one is just the red one defines them into layers. Okay. Now the total number of layers you have, the the green the synthetic plus point by point. Okay. Uh, measurement in the field. Okay. 
So here, the synthetic model actually defined the boundary of the aquifer. As you can see, even though the layer model continues, continues at a very low residuity value, after this point, there's no more water. So you will use the synthetic to define the boundary of the aquifer each time we do our interpretation. And in this case, we notice that this is a sandstone fracture uh, aquifer. Others I've showed before are shelly aquifer. So we notice that the receivity gets higher within the sandstone, but not the normal sandstone receivity. So within the fracture system, the receivity for sandstone fracture aquifer is uh, less than 200 ohm meter and more than 100 ohm meter. But that of shells are less than 52 ohm meter. So these are uh, the electromagnetic uh, uh, plot. We have two forms of plot for electromagnetics. We do the single, single profile plots. Uh, we also took it down to 2D profile. For the single profile plot, we you have to plot the vertical dipole and the horizontal dipole against the spacing. So here, each time the vertical dipole crosses is higher than the horizontal dipole, you have water. It's a fracture zone. So here, there's no water. There's water here. There's water here. This is for, on the same point, go we try to generate to this. So we did 10 meter spacing, 20 <clears throat> meter spacing, and the 40 meter spacing. So the 20 meter spacing showed further that that fracture we saw at the shallow upper is actually inclined fracture. As you can see, as far as there is opening, it means the fracture is continuous. Where they cross, if that's the end of the fracture. And if there's more volume of water here, and the separation is higher, and the volume is reducing this way. This is for the 40 meter, showing that the, the fracture we saw at 10 meter is continuous up to 40 meter depth. Now, those three graphs, we combine the data set using a locate uh, model to generate 2D on Wena array. And then uh, that's how we plotted this uh, using RESIS 2D inversion software. And uh, it's actually confirmed from what you can see here that the base are deepening. And the fracture zone, the fracture layer is also deepening with the base. Another thing we find out is that the conductivity values for water bearing zones are, must be greater than 40 millimoles. If it's less than 40 millimoles, there won't be water. So when we look at the, the, the VS signature, the geoelectric where we showed the upper and lower boundary of the, of the aquifer, the earlier, that's, that's the 2D model of that same location. You see that the water is trapped inside. It's like this fracture just entered the layer and stopped here. So when we drill through from top to this point, there's no water. The water only occurred here. After this depth, the water disappears again. And you will see it even from the values of the, of the, uh, the EM data. So this model showed that the, the 2D tomography can actually model the, 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 the shape of the subsurface. So that's why it showed this. And of course, I said, well, the environment is known for its anticlinal nature. And you can see the model showing the anticline continuously, showing that if you drill here, this is the drilling point, the drill point. If you drill here, the water is deeper. If you target here, it will be shallower. This one doesn't have water. This is an abortive well. And how did we know? You can see that the, race, the conductivity is less than 40 ohm meter. So once the conductivity is less than 40 ohm meter, and you also look at depth range, it's obvious that you won't get water there. So we correlated the drilled wells, sampled wells within the environment. And we realized that most of the, the fracture zones, they exist at depth below 18 meter. So most times you may some, find some minor fractures before the depth of 18 meters, but they are not, they don't have enough water to sustain the well. So we went further to look at the, the vulnerability of this aquifer to pollution from anthropogenic sources. And we realized first that the aquifer, the vadozone thickness is thin. 
most places they are less than 18 meters deep. So which is a sign that there are chances of pollution from the surface getting to the groundwater. We also realize again that it has a reasonable permeability. The Vado zone has reasonable permeability that is unlike um, argillaceous rocks. So is under indication that water uh, pollutants can go down the to the aquifer system. And uh, we try to use a uh, hydraulic, evaluate the hydraulic resistance. Notice that most of the areas have little or no resistance to hydraulic, uh, to transmission of uh, fluid. And so is a sign that area, the aquifer system could be polluted. We reconfirmed it using a GOD and GOD also agrees that the area is prone to pollution. Where's GOD? Groundwater <laughs> is lengthy. It's one of the models for assessing uh, pollution. Yes. So we'll, now the present research, which we intend to carry on with, we are just trying to now model the flow. Having seen that at some point the fractures are discrete, at some point they are, yeah, they try to cross each other. So we're trying to do a, a model the environment, the flow, and see the interconnectivity of the fractures and also evaluate the, the impact of climate change on the aquifer system. So um, we want to answer such uh, questions. We, want, we believe that the structural elements associated with groundwater can actually be delineated from digital elevation models. And we're also thinking that the groundwater flow model can enhance groundwater development and management in that area if we develop it. We're also thinking that if we use aquifer data as inputs, it will also enhance understanding and future prediction within the groundwater system. So uh, in trying to do this, we looked at existing models that have been applied in groundwater studies, uh, especially linking it with the uh, climate change. Uh, we have made some observations. One is that two or more models can actually be integrated in evaluating an environment. Number two, we observe that out of the 16 outlined on the, on the slide, only hydrogeosphere mud flow and grace can model surface groundwater interface. And we observed again that Nigeria is actually behind when it comes to climatic studies relating to groundwater. And that's, you can see that there's only grace and SWAT model has been uh, applied in studying the climate effect on groundwater system in Nigeria. And out of these two, Two of them, none can actually evaluate aquifer system. So it's more like Nigeria does studies relating climatic studies or changes to agricultural impact only. We have not really focused on impact of climate on aquifer systems in Nigeria. And that is why no article has published such an impact on the aquifer system. So we think that if we go on with this research, we'll be coming up with models that will affect changes, especially where it is a bit deviating from the usual basement system to sedimentary basin fracture system. So we are proposing uh, to use a mod flow. The most recent is a mod flow six, which was recently produced. Uh, we are thinking among other software and this may be our major software. We evaluate it. If uh, there's need, we may, um, uh, we may modify it, or we carry on with the most flow software. So the research methodology will involve uh, using two, one or two of the fresh near surface with physical fracture detecting mechanisms to delineate fractures in the area. And then we carry on with possibly uh, receivity using 2D, 3D tomography to reconsider the fracture system on ground, a sort of ground truthing. We look at where that are, we do some pumping tests and match it with borehole little logs to actually delineate the fractures in the aquifer zones. And we will need soil data 
and meteorological data. And all these will form input into the model for us to be able to not just look at the aquifer system modeling, but also look at climatic impact, uh, climate change impact on the groundwater system. So this is the flow chart for the model development. And uh, at the end of everything, we will test the hypothesis and see how we have done well. So we are believing that at the end of this research, we should be able to identify a regional a fracture, a water bearing fractures, where we can have some reservoirs to supply water to the areas that are, that are not blessed with these fractures. We're also believing that we'll develop effective models for groundwater prediction and management in the area. We also think that people will have more access to portable water and uh, it will as well serve as a platform for city planners and government policies to be reviewed within that environment. So it's, I have the pleasure of inviting anyone who is interested in this research to collaborate with us. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions. Um, I, uh, I wanted to mention, I meant to say this in the introduction, but I think it's a great, uh, a great thing. So Ikeda is, a, is a, a, an academic and a researcher, but he also has his own borehole company. So not only is he uh, uh, drilling boreholes for income, but also gathering all the data. Um, it sounds like a very clever uh, combination of academic and private. And in fact, I think Chris is up to the same thing, except for with hydrogen. So there you go. Um, any questions and thoughts about the project or ideas are very welcome. With your uh, techniques, have you played a for groundwater drinking of the resources? Um, the response is going to be stronger with saline water. And um, how deep can you go and what sort of resolution might you be able to use these techniques for looking at fracture fluids deeper in the deeper systems? Well, uh, the, the, the parameters can go up to 300 meters can go up to 300 meters. And um, the, the challenge the, with the Jody Street Fortress is that the maximum you can probe is 60 meters. Uh, but why we had to use it in the environment, most of the boroughs sank recently are, are less than 50 meters. And that's mm -hmm. why we feel comfortable with the methods we use. But uh, although I was sharing something with Richard last year, Early last year, we had droughts. So that's where the concept started coming into my mind that about 80% of the drip bubbles dried up. And so there, we realized the need to sink deeper well. Also, people, individuals, but most of these bowls are owned by individuals. So individuals now are getting more money to sink more bowls. And knowing that is a fracture system, most of the Multiple goals in an environment are all tapping from the same fracture system. So, but I think most at most are gone is 80 meters. So. If, if, if they're drying up, then God's how old is the water? At what point is it to recharge the river? If what happens is that like if you have multiple goals like this called the shallower one, you know, normally at the dry season, the water table will drop. So the shallower ones will dry up. During next rainy season, the recharge will come up and they will have water. So it's just a, it's, it's just a, yeah, it's a good and play playing the recharge. So if, if, if you go, the, the alternative they have is to drill another road and make it deeper. Are you, are you getting changes in salinity or changes in JPS? No, there's, we don't really, we have brines. We have brines within the environment. But they are more like they are more like uh, lenticular. Exactly. Are defined the environment and within the Abakali town. You don't have rice. But when you move towards uh, Uburu, where I mentioned the Aboti for uh, some kilometers, we have rice. So and then you can image those. I have not actually uh, 
had interest in research within the growing areas, but definitely the receivity will drop further, should be there. Yeah, drops further. Okay. So, yeah, because so, yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much. That was very interesting, and it is clearly a complicated problem. I was going to ask you if you have data for the water table and so the piezometric surface to get groundwater flow direction. But if you're drilling your own boreholes, you must have that data then where you could plot the piezometric surface and determine groundwater flow directions. Is that right? Well, I've not done it per se, but we have looked at uh, the CVD ranges at different layers, layer model, and we realize the CVD is uh, increasing in depth, of course, uh, because of the geology. Uh, within the fractal zones, it reduces, but I'm not plotted. Uh, I think part of what we may try in this work. Okay, and what? But then, what I was going to ask you then is that uh, you're going to a model with mod flow, and so it's in the word. It's about groundwater flow, and so you've been talking a lot about the depth of occurrence of water. But in order to go from that. The actual flow directions and things, you need things like the hydraulic conductivity and the anisotropy of hydraulic conductivity. So how do you make the jump from the data that you have to be able to input the things you need for the groundwater flow itself, the dynamic system? Uh, I mentioned that the methodology that will run some pumping tests, we'll do pumping tests within the environment, and mm -hmm. from there we'll calculate the hydraulic conductivity. From transmissivity, we calculate the hydraulic conductivity. And when we have it for the environment, we'll be able to plot. So you will put in um, a, a well to pump plus observation wells to capture the anisotropy. No, we should be using single wells. These are individual wells. So it's not government wells, not a research well. So it's difficult for you to put observation well and observe from the area. So the pumping test we're doing is on single wells. If you do a pump test on a single well, you don't get the, the changes with direction of groundwater flow, do you? You have to model that. Yes. And you, okay. You have to guess what that might be. Once, uh, we, when we have the pumping test result from the individual wells, we plot it and we model it and we we'll get the regional change. Of course, we'll measure piezometric heads as well. So we'll be able to know uh, this, this is the, the water level here, this water level there, this water level there. We have done similar work, but in this, we want to expand it with this research. Could I just make a comment from the model perspective? And then I see that Neil Hart has a question. Um, inevitably, the model, the, the observations will be spot observations, and they'll be sparse, and they won't be as detailed as we want. Um, but uh, there's a lot of factors, including understanding of the local geology, the lineaments that re yes. represent faults, and hopefully by um, hypothesizing conductivity structures and then modeling the flow, we can uh, compare with the sparse observations and potentially limit the possible range of models uh, based on fitting the observations and look for best fitting models. So it's not it's not a straightforward, you know, use the data, know the structure, run the, run the model. So what are you fitting to? You say best fit. Uh, I mean, I think the resistivity, uh, the depth profile, I mean, you know, it's just early days, so I wouldn't say that I have a definitive answer, but, you know, um, occurrence and uh, you know these the, the um, pressure I think that you measure in boreholes. Maybe I shouldn't say any more because I think at this stage it's not known. The answer is not known. But maybe you can you want to comment on that? Well, I think uh, because we have uh, a complex situation as you observe. For example, the some of the fracture systems are, are not quite continuous. That's what I'll try to say there. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, some are jumped. So it, you, you, it will be like you know, compartmentalizing the, the study area and have it in, in boxes so that you are 
it will be more concentrating on each box system mm -hmm. and you'll be able to do what is near uh, perfect and understand the fact that government is not playing the role of providing the wealth. Uh, you, you don't en encroach into somebody's privacy, say, I want to use your wealth for one, two, three days. So those things are not, uh, they are not feasible within the environment. So we are trying to generate uh, part of the sources we record here is to generate some questions, scientific questions that will attract the attention of the public or the government or the policy makers to understand the need for some of this uh, investment in terms of research. I see that Neil Hart, who's uh, listening in from geography, uh, has a question. So Neil, can you? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Right. Um, well, Dr. Abbasi, it's great to to um, have you in Oxford. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person today. I've uh, been a bit ill this week, so I didn't want to give you my cold. Um, <clears throat> it's a really interesting talk to see. Um, and just to say that we definitely should meet up. Um, there's a student that I've been working with on their master's project who's been looking at borehole do data for Lusaka, so the city of Lusaka, and has been tracking trends in um, groundwater levels over the last 25 years or so. Uh, and so they end up with um, some really interesting results. But I think in, in that study, it's very much on the depth of the groundwater um, and uh, trends related to that and, and a lot less on um, the actual hydrogeology that you're looking at. Um, so I think it'll be really good. You might be quite interested in, in, in the work that they've done for a different uh, location. <clears throat> My question is um, perhaps posed in two ways. Is that is the one uh, from this data, are you able to get an indication of any trends in the depth of the groundwater? Or to put it differently with your drilling company, has the depth at which you strike groundwater been changing substantially um, over the course of your operations? Yes, uh, it has been changing. As I, I showcased here, I want to call up the slide again. It's not, con it's not uniform. The reason is that uh, one is fracture controlled and it has something to do with the geology of the area, like even the, the strength, the strength of the formation of the geologic unit to withstand pressure gives room to the level of damage or deformation it will have. So that's where geology comes in. So in this case now, yeah, most times we notice it's fluctuating. For example, if the water occurs in, uh, in shale, it, it, it may start at a different depth range. If it's occurring in muddy shell or mosto, the level the extent will be different. If it's occurring now in sandstone, the degree of resistance also varies. So you see there's mineralogy, geochemical composition of the rock. And then another factor is the, the distance of the force from the point where you are. For example, if there's magmatism two kilometers away, it will affect them more than if the magmatism is taking place like 10, 15 kilometers away. So these are the factors that gave rise to depth. But as I showed in this uh, slide, the depth curve keeps on varying from one location to another. I don't know if I answered your question. Um, well, well, I think you did, but in a way that um, I had missed <laughs> in saying it's about the geology. I guess my question was more about if there's been changes in that depth, which you think might be related to longer term changes in the water table. Um, but I guess what you're saying is it's very difficult to disentangle that because uh, geology has such a role to play. So, yeah, no, thank you for your answer. That was great. I wanted to ask you again about the not how well the, the local geology is known. I mean, in the app, without knowing anything about the fractures, um, is there a sense of what is the, the structural um, uh, layout, the arrangement of, of the local geology depth to, you know, different layers in, throughout the region, which could inform 
hypotheses about permeability and, and well, the, the local geology has been well documented, far, far more than the references I gave here. But the, the challenge we have is that most of the people that are doing geology studies uh, are, are sedimentology stratigraphers. So their interest is quite different from our own interest. So we, uh, because there is not a primary sedimentary basin where you have primary porosity and permeability, if, if, if I'm talking of Afibo sub basin or the Anambra basin on the left hand flank, I'll be able to say, yes, I did there to see water. I did there to see water. But this one is purely structurally controlled. So we, that's why we rely majorly on our geoelectric data and borehole it a lot. That's why it's important. That's why we did those state of work first. So we have crater with the information we have. I can tell you in the in North Osford, this is different. In this area, this is different. Mm -hmm. So we have such information, but not from normal geology study, rather from our oh. Let me try again. I, so I'm I'm uh, wondering whether if fracture characteristics are partly controlled by the geology, then would it be helpful to know things about like, well, we know, for example, uh, that the shale tends to have water bearing fractures. And we know that the, the shale is in a depth range, you know, from 20 to 30 meters here and over here, it's down at 40 to 60 meters or something. Yes, yes, well, well um, Aguman in 1989 did that. Yeah. Uh, Ubiora and Keran in 2011 did that. So we have, in fact, Obasi, Obasi and uh, Selemo 2018, we did density analysis in the area and we were able to have a log session of thicknesses of this formation and the source of So they are there in literature. One more, more question. If you go to a random place in this region and you drill a borehole without just completely blind, what do you think is the probability that there will be water? 50-50. 50-50, okay. The truth is that, as I said, the fracturing is so common. Yeah. It's so common that you can actually make it such limp in the dark and then don't drip. Mm -hmm. And luckily, you can pray like Africans, we are very religious. You pray God give us water and you see water. <laughs> <laughs> so God's about fifty percent effective. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. I mean, but there are areas actually we have delineated on our own. Like we have a, a, a drilling team that is a, a union. So if if for example you are sending me to Summer Town here in Oxford, I'm, I'm not done drilling there. I have a job. A client asking me, so what I will do is to call and uh, come to the union platform. Please, has anybody drilled in Summer Town? Mm -hmm. What's the geology like? Is there water? Somebody will quickly tell you, ah, at the western part of Summer Town, don't go there, there's no water. <laughs> at the eastern part, oh, there's water. So these are like preliminary information we have before we even go in. Yes. I guess I was just thinking, like, suppose you wanted to generate a random model of the permeability uh, beneath the Abaliki region. What should be the kind of average coverage of the fractures? So, you know, how would your random model reproduce the idea that you have a 50% probability of drilling into water? Something like that, you know? Like that, that kind of very integrated constraint. You might not know where the fractures are, but you know that at any given place, there's a 50% chance that there's a fracture right there. If I got your question clearly, yeah. I try to say, uh, well, as I'm standing here, yeah. if you give me a call from Abakaliki, yeah. I'll tell you, this zone, don't drill. Mm -hmm. There's no water. Yeah, yeah. This zone, yeah. So with yeah. that, uh, we have a, 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 a reasonable degree of confidence in this fracture distribution. Mm -hmm based on our previous work mm -hmm. in the field. Um, I can say we can, we can predict like 70%. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. I don't mean that you should drill randomly. I just mean if you did drill randomly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think you can do like seventy percent. Uh, Other questions? Anything online? Okay. Well, with that, thank you again, Kenna. Okay.